continue transitioning and transforming, God. You continue moving in this day and age. And our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I want to read this scripture as it's Pentecost Sunday. It said, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and, re and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We give God the honor and glory today. For more than two years ago, for more than two years ago, God did this mighty movement and he's still moving today in our day and age. We are an apostolic movement. We believe in the movement of our God and the movement of the Spirit of the Lord. I want to encourage you today because God is famous for so many things. And today we celebrate the day of Pentecost where we were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Come on, put your hands together today, church, and let's worship the Lord together. There is a fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen your faithfulness, my fortress.
If you believe God is faithful, if you know the work of God is moving in your life, uh, why don't you release it today? Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus uh, and be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit this day? Uh, for God is here and he has done so many great things uh, and we have a name. Uh, we have a name that we call out to, a name that we cry out to, and we believe not only because of everything he's done, but because he didn't stay dead in the grave, uh, but he rose with all power and authority. And so we worship him every Sunday. We worship him every day proclaiming the name of our God. Let's worship him today, church, and proclaim he is risen. Risen. He's risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, God is good, 
and he is worthy to be praised. As you're standing right there, we just want to make a couple of announcements. Of course, we have our midweek service happening this Thursday at 7 o'clock. Everybody is welcome to join us. Uh, prayer starts at 7, and then uh, right after that, we go into some Bible studies. We have a good time. Uh, this Saturday, there's a couple things going on, but first and foremost, the youth, empowered youth, praise the Lord, youth. Amen. There's going to be a hike. Uh, we're asking that uh, right now the plan is to meet at Torrey Pines at 8 o'clock. All right. I know that's early, but last, last time you guys did this, I heard you saw some dolphins. I heard you had some wonderful time out there hiking, and it was a fun time. So please, everybody, 8 o'clock, if you need to meet up ahead of time, talk to one another, uh, get each other to, to help with rides. Um, Brother Daniel's here, Brother Isaias are here today, so talk to them if you uh, want to make some plans or else on Thursday when you see them again during the week. Praise God. So our young people hiking at Torrey Pines, 8 o'clock this Saturday. Um, also this Saturday, the ministers, praise the Lord, brothers. Uh, all the ministers, we have a mandatory training. It's our annual training that we have to go through. This is for uh, credential certification. So it'll be at 9 o'clock at Escondido Church. That's 9 o'clock at Escondido Church. If you miss that, you can go to the 1 o'clock uh, training, but that one will be in Spanish. Praise God. So you have uh, either choice there. All the ministers, mandatory uh, ministerial training for credentialing. Praise God. Next Sunday... There will be a united service. So next Sunday, everybody come on by 1130. You get to sleep in a little bit on Sunday. Uh, come at 1130. Better yet, don't sleep in. Wake up and pray. Amen. Pray to the Lord. Ask God for his blessing, that he covers the church, that he covers our pastor. And speaking of prayers, we got a lot of different uh, requests out there. So I want everybody right now, as you look up here on the screen, just pick a name. Pick a name in the middle. Pick a name towards the end. Maybe it's a name you've already been praying for. If you've already been praying for someone, pick someone else. Um, but pick a name up here and, and, and pray. But not only pray for that person. If you know who they're related to, if you know uh, what, 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 who their friend is here at church, go and talk to them. Ask them how they're doing. And if you can, make your way over to their house and pray for them with that other person. Amen. We need, to, we need to be in prayer for one another, church. Amen? I say we need to be in prayer for one another, church, and ask God to bless one another and help each other uh, to grow and to be recovered and to be strengthened by the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Let's go before the Lord with a prayer, and then we'll take up an offering. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you, Lord, for the work that is here at Calvary Temple. We thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are faithful, God, in everything. You are faithful, God, in job, in our work. You are faithful, God, uh, with our family. You are faithful, Lord, um, with, with friends. But, God, more than all of that, you are faithful toward us, Jesus. And we're grateful, Lord, because we have blessing after blessing, and we're thankful. Even when we're in the middle of a difficult situation, that is truly where we understand where the blessing of God is because we know this is not the end. We know there are greater things that you have in store for your church. You have mansions prepared for us. You have a home prepared for us. For this is not our home, but we are merely passing through it, Lord. And as we pass through, we go through trials, we go through tribulations, and we pray for those that are going through cancer treatments, Lord, that are uh, under going surgery or in need of healing, Lord Jesus, that are in need, Lord God, uh, of strength in their bones and their bodies. And we especially pray, Lord, for our preacher today who continues to recover, but we are thankful, God, that he's here and the strength that you place inside of him, Lord. We honor you, Lord, with our prayer and we lift up our tithes and our offering to your name, giving you great praise, Jesus, and asking you, Lord, to do a work in us. Let your spirit fall, God, for we are yours. We belong to you. Have your way with us. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray amen amen church come on come on up if you want to give online you can do so by visiting our website sanmarcosapostolic.org in the name of the Lord. peace and free.
their classrooms. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Hallelujah. As many of you know, I'm still recovering, but for me, it is such a blessing to bring the word of God, such an honor that I could never say no. I had to be here some way, somehow to bring the word and God has placed a message on my heart to remind us that something is coming. A great event is coming to the church and it is the rapture of the church on the timeline of God in the prophecy and the prophetic timeline. There's nothing else left to happen but the rapture. And I ask you all today, are you rapture ready? Are you ready? Are your robes whitened? Or are you fooling around with the world still? Come on, let's get ready. Luke 17, 44 and 35 says this. I tell you, on that night, two people will be, one in bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together and one will be taken and the other left. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that it speaks to us what we need to hear, Lord Jesus. We receive this word and we pray that you prepare us all to be rapture ready, Lord Jesus, as your return is closer and closer every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may take your seats. The rapture of the church. How many of you remember as a kid hearing about the rapture, the rapture, it's coming And years go by and it seems like nothing's happening. But if you pay attention on the world scene, the pieces are coming together. If you read in Revelation, the prophetic end times say that there will be certain things that come into place to set the tone. And so we see that if we pay attention, if we really do, and we read our scripture and we understand, we see that every day it's coming closer. Every day everything is being prepared for the return of the Lord to take up his church in the rapture. And you have to be ready. You have to have your heart ready. The passage of scripture is referring to that taking away of the true believers. And we believe that the church is composed of the dead in Christ and faithful living on earth at the time of the rapture will be lifted up to meet the Lord in the sky. And when we were baptized, our names were written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? How many many of you have your name written? Amen. And when the Lord says picks up his church, it will be amongst those whose name is written in that book of life. And so securing our salvation, securing our afterlife is important. If you've been on the fence, today is the day of salvation. If you have not been convinced that giving your life to Christ, if you think it's not time yet, you're not ready, it's time. You need to do it. And it's a gift freely given to you. Christ offered his life on Calvary for your salvation, for your eternal salvation. And it's a free gift that you only need to receive. There's nothing you need to do that is extraordinary. You're never going to live up to God's standards. That's why he offers salvation. He did something that you could never do. He attained perfection, and in your place, he died on that cross. And he said, all you need to do is receive me as your Savior, and you are covered. Who wouldn't give in to the beautiful gift of salvation? Who would resist such a beautiful, eternal gift to secure the afterlife alongside your your Christ, your creator? There's no other way. There is no other way. There is no other path. You could never become 
good enough on your own merits, on your own behavior, on your own will and emotion. None of us could. That's why Christ died on Calvary. He took your place. Amen. Thank Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that gift freely given. And we do see that this world is continually going against biblical principles. Society is going against everything that we believe in that we stand for. Times are going to get dangerous. That even people who are, were at one time in church start to begin to believe the lies. And to say, well, what's, what's wrong with this, that, the other society is teaching this. You know, it makes sense to me distancing themselves from biblical principles. Now is a time that we need to stand even firmer from what we believe and not relent in the face of society trying to change what we know, what's established, trying to add different terminology, trying to add different unscientific principles just because someone feels a certain way. I'm sorry, my Bible teaches standards. My Bible teaches truth. My Bible teaches what is right and wrong, and it still stands today. Truth is still truth. Men are still men. Women are still women. And there's no, none of this new stuff. No. My Bible teaches me different. Now, let's say, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 8 says this. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That means our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, our bishops and pastors that have gone ahead of us. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus is coming. When the trumpet sounds, we are going to respond to that call, and we're going to meet him up in the sky. Those of us who have devoted our lives to seeking God, are we perfect? No. We're on that journey of perfection. We're trying. We're in an effort to ever increasingly draw closer to God and to sanctify ourselves and to, and to push off the worldly things. It doesn't happen overnight. I remember being a young man, newly baptized, and I was so concerned because I found out really fast, Pastor, that I wasn't perfect. I felt after I got baptized like I was floating on air. How many of you remember that feeling? Amen. But the first hint that I was still human, I said, "Uh uh-oh, what happened? I failed God. And I quickly, quickly found out the definition of grace. Because I found out, yes, you're not perfect, but son, stay in this journey, stay in this path, and I will perfect you as you keep seeking. But you got to keep seeking. You don't win a race. What happens if you are in second place on a race? And last minute, you decide to just cut out. You're disqualified. The whole race was for nothing. But if you keep at it, you might still get that second place. And the same thing with walking in the path for God. If you get discouraged because of something and you throw in the towel, it was all for nothing. Stay in the race. Remain. Keep fighting for your spiritual life. Keep fighting for your growth. Keep fighting to get to a better place in God where you are perfected in Christ. If you feel there's still a lot of world in you, then you need more consecration. Because I've said it once, I've said it before, that it, who you feed is going to be stronger. If you feed the carnal, you're going to be carnal. If you feed the spiritual, you're going to build up that spiritual man. And then when the worldly temptation comes, it'll be nothing. You can resist easily. Easily. Tell me why some people here used to have the habit of smoking cigarettes, and once they get into church and they get consecrated, it's even disgusting to them to smell a cigarette or to see a beer or whatever, whatever habit they had, you know, whatever drug of choice they had. It's disgusting to them. Why? What changes? What changes? It's their mentality. They're spiritual. They're filled with the word of God. They're filled with the spirit of God. And they see things differently. You see, God, this is so simple. God wants to save your soul eternally so that after this life, in the next life, You have a life of eternity, not in hell because you lived a sinful life, but in heaven alongside God. Isn't that beautiful? Second, in this life, in this world, while you live here, he wants you to have a better life. So he teaches you, the Bible gives you principles on how to live a better, peaceful life. Some people say, you know, the Bible, the Christians, they want to take away my fun. They want to, oh, they're so boring. They don't do, they don't party. They don't drink. They don't do drugs. They don't do all these things. How boring. 
You know what God is really trying to do? He's trying to give you a peaceful life. Because people that live that way, in the moment, it's fun. While they're up in the club, it's fun at that moment. But then that lifestyle brings death. It brings, it brings financial ruin. It brings ruins relationships. It brings problems. Does anyone know someone, or are you from a family who your father or uncle or someone was an alcoholic? Abusive? I've seen abuse and alcoholism in my family. It's an ugly thing. And God is not trying to take away your fun. He's trying to give you a peaceful, better life while you're here. Amen? And then once God has saved your soul eternally, transformed your life into a peaceful life here, he asks one thing of you. Share your story. Share the gospel. Share what God did for you to others, and that is your testimony. That is your evangelism. That is your soul winning. That's all. It's three simple things that God asks you to do. So when God is trying to help you be transformed, do not resist God. Allow God to take away the bad habits. In my life right now, God is working with me in one area. And he's saying, yes, you excelled in this and that. You're studying of the word, your prayer, everything is fine. How about this area? And it's my physical body, my health. Because if I do not have my health, pastor, what good am I if I know how to preach and teach? If I'm up in the hospital with IV in me every other three months? No. So that's what God is dealing with me. He wants me to have a good, peaceful life. Healthy. Happy. Because I need to preach. I don't know about y'all, but I love the word and I need... Johnny, I need to preach. I need to preach. It's something God placed in my heart. Since I was an infant, he said, this little baby is going to be a preacher. He's going to be a teacher. And I have something in me. It's a fire. And I need to preach. I need to teach. And I can't, I can't be bedridden. I need to be healthy. I need to be up here. And the emotions I feel sometimes, I wish I could leap off the stage and run the aisles. But I can't. Right now. But I will. Amen. I was, telling, I was telling a good friend and brother in Christ recently that this last stint in the hospital, it fired me up. It got me upset. To, I mean, I was red upset, like just breathing fire upset with myself. And I said, I have all the power in me to change. And I have a wonderful Lord and Savior to help me when I can't. And I, I got fired up. I said, things are going to change. And things are changing in Jesus' name. But we are going to be soon caught up and meet our Lord in the sky. And you need to be ready. You need to prepare your robes. Whiten your robes. It's not yet the second coming because the second coming we return with Christ to judge the nations. This is the rapture. We meet him halfway. And many think that we're going to get battered and bruised and go through that the church is going to go through the tribulation. But Revelation 3.10 says this. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. The, the Lord's not going to beat up his bride. He's not going to allow his bride to go through that difficulty. We're going to be gone, church. Amen. Amen. How many of you want to, want to be here during the tribulation? Mm-mm. Revelation 13, 7, 8 also says this about that time that is coming. After the rapture, begin the seven-year tribulation. How many of you read about that or heard about that? If not, ask one of your leaders, youth leaders, or someone around you to, to teach you on that. The seven-year tribulation is a period where the first three and a half years is peace. And if you've heard of the Antichrist, he's a world leader that comes and impresses everybody. I mean, he's like, he's like one of those public speakers that just everybody, the whole crowd is enraptured by his speeches, by his intellect, by his leadership. And he's going to unite the world into one world government, one world, everyone's at peace, no war. Look at what it says. It was given power, the Antichrist, to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in, 
in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the... It says everybody but those whose names were written on the book. The Lamb's book of life. Why? Why not them? Because we're gone. Not even here. We're raptured. All except those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life. And we see the European Union and the United Nations, all these groups that are trying to unite the world. And there's always a push for global this, global that. We should be, they're trying to erase borders. They're trying to erase nations. And it's all a setup for what's coming, church. The Bible spoke about it years ago. A few years ago, there was also a resolution passed in the European Union that gives one individual power over the whole European Union militarily if there's a crisis. That's all being set up for one purpose, for the one world government. But, but the Bible says that we will be raptured. Revelation 19.20 says, But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown into the lake of fire of burning sulfur. At the end, God wins. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand praise. Hallelujah. That one world government, how many of you see signs of that already? The Bible also says that during this period, it'll be a cashless society. Can you see that coming? Where there's a chip where the chip has all your, it has your, your debit card, it has your bank account, it has everything, your medical record. I see that coming. I see it. It could happen now. Your, your health pass, see if you have the COVID vaccine or not. All those things in one chip. And you will not be, how many of you, even during COVID, saw hints of, oh, you can't, you can't come in unless you're vaccinated, right? How far a stretch is it to say, well, you can't buy or sell unless you have this mark, unless you have the chip? Do you have the chip? You, you can't come into Albertsons. You, you don't have the chip. It's just one step, church, one leap. And we see all of that coming into place. But the Bible says, Again, let me go back. It says, all except those who were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if I was you, I want, I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to be raptured, and I want to be rapture ready. I don't want to be here to find out. And sadly, many who thought they were Christian, who thought they were true believers, will lament. Well, how is it possible, Brother Reuben? It's relationship. It's relationship. Do I have proof? Yes, Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Let's read that. Let's see what it says about people who thought they were saved. That's what I'm saying. You've got to be secure. You've got to know your God. You've got to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And you've got to secure your salvation. You've got to know that you have an intimate relationship with him because many are going to think that they were good. I did the sinner's prayer. Oh, it, I know I'm saved. Really? Matthew 7, 21, 23 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. Wait a minute. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. God honors his name. He'll, he'll heal the sick. He'll cast out a demon when his name is called. But if the individual who's speaking it, may not have a relationship with God. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Wait a minute, I thought I was a believer. I never knew you, God said. What does that speak of when God says, I never knew you? Relationship. Were you ever in prayer before the Lord? Were you ever in a close, intimate relationship with your God and with his word? For him to say, I never knew you, obviously God is all-knowing. He's omnipotent, omniscient. He knows who you are, but he's talking about relationship. He says, I never knew you. You never came to me. We were never close. And that's what I'm talking about here today. I'm here to remind the church, draw closer to God and build that relationship with your heavenly father because you do not want it said of you, I never knew you, my son. I know who you are. I know who's who your mother and father, I know where you grew up, I know who you are, but I don't know you. There's no relationship. The rapture is for the devoted 
and consecrated believer who's on the lifelong journey of seeking God, the one who has a relationship with God, the one who knows God intimately. And there's a big difference between being a believer and being a servant of God, a disciple of God. Because my Bible tells me that even the demons know who God is. They tremble at his name. They know who he is. But knowing and believing that he exists is not enough. You need a relationship with God. And a true servant is always on that relentless path of seeking further after God, to know him deeper, to know him more intimately, to know his word more intimately. John 14, 13 says this, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. He promised to return for his bride, for his people, for his church. Are you today rapture ready? Talking about the seven-year tribulation, let's go to Daniel 9 and 27. It says that he will confirm a covenant with many for one period of seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And as a temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed and poured out on him. Now, this is an interesting thing because this temple is talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Right now, there is an Arabic mosque over the Dome of the Rock where they profess that the Prophet Muhammad levitated. And so it's a holy site for the Muslims. That's why the Jews have not built the third temple because there's conflict there between, with the Arabs. Now, whatever needs to happen, I don't know if Israel is going to completely annihilate and dominate the Muslims and say, we don't care about your Dome on the Rock, we're building the third temple. And here's proof that this is our site. I don't know how it's going to play out, But my Bible tells me that for this to happen, the third temple has to be rebuilt. And in Israel, there's already a movement, a group of people that are ready to rebuild. They've dug tunnels and they believe that they've seen the Holy of Holies and have quickly been arrested and removed as their their tunnel exposed the Holy of Holies. They have the red heifer, which is a special sacrificial cow that can be used, only a red heifer. They have the red heifer ready. They have all the utensils ready for the sacrifice. The candelabria, everything, the laver, everything is ready. And another thing, a few years ago, there's a certain color purple that only a certain sea snail can produce that that purple is used on the priestly robe. It had been extinct. I believe it was about 10 years ago, miraculously began to wash up on the shore Thousands upon thousands of that once extinct sea sea snail. Now they're harvesting them in preparation to make the royal purple for the priestly robe. Pieces are getting put together. And if we don't see it, uh, it's on us, but, but on the prophetic timeline, it's coming. Immediately after the rapture, this Antichrist emerges. He comes on the scene and he begins to dominate the world and to be impress the world with his speech, with his intellect, with his leadership. But it is the Antichrist, a political leader. He will be revered as a great leader and unifier. But then, during that third year, 13 and a half years, he sits in that temple. That's what I'm saying, the temple has to be built. He sits in that temple and he believes that he is such a grand individual that he must be worshipped. And this is when the Jews say, this is blasphemy. We can't have this. He's in our sacred temple asking to be worshipped, and he's just a mere man. That kicks off the difficult part, the persecution. Then comes the mark of the beast that you cannot buy or sell without that mark, the heavy persecution of the Jews and of anyone who will not take the mark. Now, let me say this. Right now, while there's preachers, teachers, People who are encouraging youth leaders there saying, come to church, give your life to Christ. If you can't give your life to Christ now when it's freely given and it's easy to grow and there's easy, you could even listen to podcast preachings. You could YouTube. I mean, it's everywhere and easy to give your life to Christ. Do you think you'll be able to do it under heavy persecution when you're hungry, when you're jobless, homeless and being chased by soldiers? Because you don't take the mark, you think you're going to receive the punishment which says you can only be saved if you 
allow yourself to be beheaded in the name of Christ. And you denounce the mark of the beast. Can you do it if you can't do it now? I don't know. I don't want to find out. I want to give my life completely to Christ right now. Freely. Revelation 13, 16, 17 says, It is also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. So now is the time of salvation. Let's prepare our robes. Let's prepare ourselves to be rapture ready. Church, we're seeing the chess pieces being placed in order. We're seeing everything coming into place and society is distancing themselves from biblical principles. Amen? There's even some churches where the pastors are, you see the rainbow flag behind them? You see them teaching certain things, um, uh, he, him, zir, zir, and all that stuff. Pastors allowing that and teaching that. Anti-biblical principles in the church. So now is the time to be vigilant, church. Now is the time to pay attention to how you're living and get yourself ready for what's coming. I invite you to stand to your feet. If you want to renew your vows before the Lord, this altar is open. And remember that God right now is dealing with mankind through the Holy Spirit. Once the Holy Spirit is removed from this earth, you're all on your own. You're on your own. Right now, the Holy Spirit is working in your lives. Right now is the time of salvation, the day of salvation. Give your life to Christ today. There's water behind us. There's opportunity. There's opportunity to give your life to Christ and be baptized in Jesus' name to secure your salvation, to secure the afterlife. Today is the day of salvation, church. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late because there's nothing holding back the rapture. There's no prophetic event that needs to happen but the rapture. So it could happen even today. So those of you who want to whiten your robes, who want to draw closer to God, I invite you to this altar or even where you're standing, where you're sitting. But just lift up the Lord today and remember that God is always with open arms wanting to embrace us, wanting to take us to that higher level to that deeper walk, to that deeper place where we know him intimately. So let's lift up the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your precious and wonderful word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you help us to be rapture ready. We know that in the prophetic timeline, there's nothing else that needs to happen than the rapture, Lord Jesus. And we want to have whitened robes ready to receive, Lord Jesus. When we hear the trumpet sound, Lord, that we may be ready to meet you in the sky, Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are, not, are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will count not his sin. Is the blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. I praise God for the message that Brother Rubens brought forth today. We need to be ready. We need to be rapture ready at all times. No one knows the day nor the hour, but the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And what a privilege and what a blessing it is to not have our sins counted against us, to have a confidence in that God has rescued us from our sins. Uh, we've been studying in the English class and just going over some of these basic tenets, but the first is that God loves you. Amen. That God cares for you and that God wants you. Praise God. And the second is that we are sinners and, and there is no hope for our sin. We are sinful and we are sinners. And because of that, we are separated from God. But God has a plan. Amen. God has a plan. He went to Calvary. He died on that cross so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's what we're talking about today. But it's not good enough just to hear it. It's not just good enough to say, I believe it. We must 
accept the plan of God and we must live it church we must live it and if you have not received Christ in your life uh, if you have not repented in Jesus name if you have not been baptized in the baptismal waters and been filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in celebrating the day of Pentecost we know that you must be filled uh, as manifested through speaking in tongues if you don't have these things then you're not rapture ready church if you don't have these things, you're not rapture ready. But if you want them, Jesus is here for you today. And he is available. And his plan is for everyone. Amen. His plan is for the young. His plan is for the old. His plan is for the shy. His plan is for the extrovert. His plan is for the intelligent. And his plan is for the dumb. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, slave or free. If you're male or female, it doesn't matter what you want. That is diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you mind you that. Praise God. God is for everybody. And we invite you today that if you have any questions, any questions about the mysteries that were spoken here, about the plan of God, that you please come and see us, that you talk about it in your Bible studies, whether you're at a Bible study at one of the homes or with someone in particular, talk about it with your family and know the plan of God so that we might be ready and that we can rejoice every day, celebrating, knowing that our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, that we have a confidence in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap in Jesus' name. Praise God. Remember this Saturday, special events, young people hiking 8 o'clock at Torrey Pines and all the ministers 9 a.m. at Escondido or 1 o'clock if you prefer the Spanish or just a little bit more time to sleep in on Saturday morning. It's going to be a busy weekend, but God deserves all the honor and the glory. Let's go before the Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your ministry in this place. Lord, I thank you for the Bible studies that are happening at homes. I thank you for the baptisms that we're having, having, Lord. And we pray today, Lord Jesus, right now, we know that there are some that are ready. We know that there are some more that are ready for baptism, Jesus. And this message is spot on, that we must be ready for the coming of our Lord and Savior, for the rapture of the church. We must be ready so that we are not tempted and tried beyond what we could handle but that we might be lifted up with the Lord and Savior for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord Jesus, you have a plan for us, God, and we accept that plan here at Calvary Temple. We don't want the plans of the world. We don't want the ideologies of the world. We don't want their thoughts. We want your thoughts, Jesus. We want your purpose, and we want your truth. And as we're dismissed from this place, Lord, we walk under that truth. Everywhere we go, in every place that we are, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the Almighty and we are ready God should you come today should you come tomorrow Lord we are ready only help us to to be found doing your work Lord in the homes in our workplaces in the temple Lord Jesus in the sanctuary God and with our family in the precious and mighty name of Jesus and everybody says amen be blessed church and have a wonderful week in Jesus name